We're going to be talking today with an intensive care speech language pathologist, Jessica Durkovich. She has an exciting stage, a very small window, a very small specialty where she works with intubated patients. She works with them while they're intubated and what happens after they're extubated. And she has some neat stories where she's talking with her physicians about a bundle and some neat things like that, the AF bundle. So I'm excited you are with us today and we are going to get started. Hello and welcome to the Missing Link for the SLPs podcast. I am so glad you are here. Today's episode is part of the Medical SLP series where we talk to some amazing speech paths who work in a variety of medical settings, all the way from intensive care through to home care and everything else in between and beyond. You're going to hear some incredible medical SLP stories and lots of advice from these passionate medical SLPs. So hi, Jessica. Welcome to this episode of the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. Happy you are here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to share. Yeah, now, I, I in the preview, I said you are uh, an intensive care ICU speech pathologist. And so there's going to be a lot of listeners who are like, my gosh, that's what I want to do. That's so exciting. Can you tell us first your story of why you became a speech pathologist? I can. I, it goes back to high school. I was a senior in high school and our school allowed students to do it like a half day internship if we had enough credits. And I actually thought I wanted to be a lawyer like my dad or a physical therapist. So for my internship for the fall, I job shadowed a physical therapist. And during that time, got to spend time with the pediatric speech pathologist that worked on feeding. And I loved it. It wasn't something that I even knew existed. Mm -hmm. So I did not do my spring semester as an intern, as a lawyer, I decided that I wanted to do speech pathology and, um, then went to school for it, knew, never changed my major during college, just knew head on, that's what I wanted to do. I did not, my first career, my CFY was actually in a pediatric private practice. Okay. And I then after my CFY went into the hospitals, I, I was pretty certain even in grad school that I wanted to be in the medical setting Mm -hmm. and got the job and never really looked back from the medical setting. So your clinical fellow was in a pediatric outpatient private yeah. practice working yeah. with our tick or was it more of a medical outpatient? It practice? was not medical at, at all. Really. I, um, we moved around a lot for my husband's job and we had moved to a big city and I knew no one didn't really, um, even though the area and really took a job that was available to get my CFY and it was an outpatient clinic working on everything, language, Arctic. Mm-hmm. I was contracted to a school that was a charter school for kids with autism. Mm-hmm. Uh, then when that year was over, I started looking for a hospital setting because I knew that's what I wanted. And the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center had a position posted and I applied for it and then have been in the medical field since then. We've moved around a lot for my husband's job, but I've always been in a hospital setting. So what did you do to prepare yourself from moving from your private practice into the, the medical setting? Did you take any courses? Did you? I did continuing education. I had done an inter- externship my medical externship at a hospital in Indianapolis. So I felt prepared. I took courses during my CFY that were still medical based. 
And I advocated for myself. I applied for a position that was actually a CFY position. Uh, They asked me why I should get that job, even though I was done with my CFY. Also, one of the questions they asked at the interview was, what was my trach experience? And I didn't have any. And I was very honest Mm -hmm. and said that I don't, I haven't learned about that area yet. I haven't had hands-on experience, but I want the opportunity to learn. And they told me later that they appreciated my honesty. And honestly, that job, I feel like, I learned a tremendous amount. The therapists there were excellent and I had great mentors and um, went from there. So you stepped into a general medical SLP setting. Correct. So um, you and I know what that is. Can you explain to those listening what a general medical SLP does? A general medical SLP does a little bit of everything. And for probably 10 years of my career, that's what I did. I did not step into this role in the ICU until about three, three and a half years ago. So 10 or more years of my career, I was a general, what would be considered a general medical SLP. And that involved stroke floors, stroke units. We had a cancer unit The University of Pittsburgh has a large head and neck unit, liver transplant, a lot of dysphagia, and some language and some cognition. The day is very flexible. You have to be quick thinking on your feet, and we do a lot of swallow studies and radiology. Some fees in my history. We don't currently do that at the facility that I'm at. Um, It's fast paced and a busy environment. I love the ever changing of the medical setting. Mm -hmm. Especially the bigger medical settings. Yes. A lot of it is medical chart reviews, Mm-hmm. bedside swallow said bedside swallow evaluations making referrals for if someone needs an instrumental exam and then like I mentioned um, language evaluations cognitive evaluations referring patients for the next level of care mm-hmm. whether that would be acute rehab or skilled nursing facility or home and what services might a patient need once they transition home. So you're in a bigger medical setting, bigger city. So you're describing the life of a medical SLP in a big, big medical center. How many other speech pathologists are on staff with you? So currently I'm at in like a medium sized facility. We have probably seven speech pathologists ranging from full-time to part-time. I am actually a part-time speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. I cover the ICU Monday through Wednesday. And then there are two other SLPs that rotate through on a three-month basis to cover Thursday and Friday. Wow. Interesting pattern. Yes. Neat. Tell me how, so specifically honing in now on the intensive care work that you do, How does your, when does your day start? How do you start your day? How do you get your patient list? How do you determine who to see? How much autonomy do you have? Okay. I start my day around eight o'clock and the day starts initially in the speech office. As a team, we go through our day and um, kind of go over staffing. What does everyone's day look like? Who might need help? What swallow studies are on? I do help cover swallow studies for outpatients or um, the general medical floors if needed, if our staff ratio doesn't help cover that. Then around 8.30, 8.40, I round with our physical therapist and occupational therapist that cover the ICU and then our cardiac ICU. 
We have 36 beds total, 18 on our general ICU, 18 on our cardiac ICU. One speech pathologist, myself, um, covers both sides Mm -hmm. in a general day. Now, there are days that get crazy. Yesterday was one of those days that I need to call in some help. Um, So generally, though, it's enough for one therapist, and it's a pretty full, busy day. So we round in the morning with PTOT and speech. We go through the patient list and kind of discuss their needs. Do they, our physical therapists get ordered on our critical care order set right off the bat? They can then order occupational therapy. And we really have a conversation with the PT and OT who has communication needs, who has cognitive needs. And then well, I'll talk about how we get in for swallowing. So we have worked very closely with our medical staff to get placed on a our hospital's policy for the vent-dependent patient. We get in to see patients immediately when they're intubated. As soon as they start waking them up off of sedation, we are consulted for communication and our RNs can put in an order for speech to come in for communication. So with that morning rounding, our PT and OT are kind of flagging, hey, this patient did a spontaneous awakening trial on the vent yesterday, which means that they're turning off all sedation while they're on the ventilator. And we think they're appropriate for speech therapy to come in and start working on communication. After we round, we go down to the floors and we start seeing people, coordinating with the nurses, coordinating with PT and OT. There's lots of interdisciplinary coordination and care. We start seeing people again as soon as they are um, tolerating an SAT on the ventilator. SAT is a spontaneous awakening trial. They turn off all the sedating medications. We start seeing them when they're on the ventilator for communication and follow them through their stay. Once they're extubated, we have, again, worked with our physicians and have a policy in place that anyone intubated greater than 48 hours has a swallow evaluation. So we evaluate their swallowing. And then our standard work is that anyone intubated, again, more than 48 hours will also have a cognitive evaluation. That's kind of a, the gist of how we get our orders and get our day rolling. It's very impressive. You've done a lot of back work on that. A we have. Yes, we have worked. It's been uh, a lot of building trust with our physicians and proving that we can be there. Mm-hmm. We try to get in within two to four hours once someone's extubated. On swallowing, we have just, it's taken a lot of work to establish their trust that we will see their patients. What is it like when you first walk into a room with an intubated patient? Can you lay that scenario for us? Yes. So we, pre-COVID, most often we'd have, or a lot of times, not always, have family available. So introduce yourself to family we look at immediately how alert is the patient. Are they visually tracking you or around the room? That's my first, very first thing I'm looking at. Do they respond to their name? Do they turn their head? Then I start to look at their hands, how puffy and swollen are their hands. If we have done um, great with their sedation and they haven't been sedated. We have patients that can move their hands great for pointing, writing, using technology. If it's someone that's had to be on more medication, sometimes their hands are swollen up like balloons. So I'm looking quickly at their hands to make a, an assessment on how I might be able to help that patient communicate. From there, I look at, can they answer yes, no questions? With head nod, head shake, can they follow one-step commands? 
can they point? If their hands look okay, then we look at writing. Can they hold a pen? Can they write on a whiteboard? Sometimes I'm using getting creative and using Coban to make pencils bigger so that their grass doesn't have to be sure. so fine. Um, then I is can, that stretchy material. Yes. Coban yeah. is the stretchy material that they uh-huh. use to wrap. Right. Mm-hmm. We get, we get creative. I've had my OT craft up pointers for me for patients that maybe don't have as good of dexterity so that they can point to a communication board. We have had, because we are present in the ICU and have established a good relationship with our nurses, I had last week a nurse make a flip book for a patient on her own. Uh, we also will occasionally use technology. I find though that a lot of our patients are too weak for um, the fine motor that technology entails. So usually the best that we get is writing a lot of times with some type of adaptation. So we do the whole gamut. We, I have a girl right now that's just using eye gaze for yes, no on a board. It takes a lot of problem solving and creativity to figure out how these patients can communicate. Is it scary walking into an ICU room? And I would say yes, when I was a new grad. Okay. Absolutely. I can remember being a student in an ICU room with a trach patient, gowned head to toe, Mm -hmm. and feeling hot and overwhelmed. Yes, it's scary as a new grad. Now it's my it's my day in and day out. It's not. It's rewarding. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It's hard emotionally and sometimes physically. Mm-hmm. But I've gotten used to it. So yes, initially it is scary and it's hard. But if it's where you want to be and where your heart is, you can overcome that. Well, when you walk into an ICU room, there's so much to take in. Absolutely. So much to take in. Absolutely. So we, that, that is also some of my first, before I touch the patient, I'm looking at Mm -hmm. their vitals, their heart rate, their respiratory rate, their, how much oxygen are they on? If they're on a ventilator, what are their settings? Are they doing a breathing trial? Are they on heat of high flow? We are seeing more heat of high flow than ever before for with the COVID pandemic. So that's the um, nasal cannula that goes into the nose. I am not generally seeing patients when they're on BiPAP. Um, We could see those patients for communication. However, generally those patients are so tenuous that it's not the right time. Mm -hmm. So taking in the whole, looking at our, what, if it's a a patient that's intubated, looking at what drips are they on? We will see people when they are sedated, if they're waking up. So I am documenting, are they on propofol? Are they on fentanyl? We use Presidex, looking at their IV pools, reading their drips. So there is a lot to take in when you first walk into the room. Initially, it's observation. There's a lot of observation going on before even diving in to see the patient. But it's neat to hear that you can start in a general medical SLP position and move into something like that and feel confident. So when you walk in the room and you see everything, you know how to walk forward in baby steps. Well, first I'm going to check this, then I'm going to check this, and then I'm going to, uh, you know, note this and document this. So it's, it's your ability to walk in a room and problem solve and critically think your way through an evaluation of a patient or treatment of a patient is, is very important. And it has been a learning curve. Mm -hmm. So this all got started. Our hospital ICU does the A through F bundle, which is um, the ICU liberation. I have a resource for that. And 
it's research supported that patients who do this bundle have better outcomes. They have shorter ICU stays. They are on the ventilator shorter and they overall Mm -hmm. have better outcomes. We have an OT that really championed this and really championed therapy being in the ICU. And we tend to have an approach that's more instead of reactive or proactive, Mm -hmm. we're getting in there to try to prevent ICU acquired weakness. We have found that getting in and working on communication early can help reduce our delirium rates, which then delirium is directly associated with long-term cognitive deficits. And then also getting in on those swallow evaluations early, we are identifying risk for aspiration proactively instead of patients being extubated, started on a regular diet, and then failing. Right. It When our OT first approached me that about doing this, it was scary. And she would throw out these medications and say that she's talking to the physicians about turning down medications or asking the nurses. And I thought, I can't do that. That's not my scope of practice. Um, but with our physician's help and our nurses and our ICU rehab team, my learning curve has been huge. And we work together as a team. I'm not the only one Mm -hmm. asking about these medications or the only one looking at these things. And Mm -hmm. I think working as a team is what's really the most important and how you learn. I've learned so much from our interdisciplinary team. I would never have been able to do this as a lone speech pathologist. Well, there's some good words of advice right there. Reach out to the team and the strength of others. Yes. What is it like when you extubate a patient? Okay. Once a patient is extubated, as I mentioned earlier, we generally wait two to four hours based on um, some of the research out there that says we don't need to wait 24 hours. And that was an older practice. I, I worked that way previously. However, we found with waiting that 24 hours that sometimes physicians were antsy and would just start patients on a diet. So once the patient is extubated, our nurses know, they hold off, they don't give the patient anything, and they ask for the physician to put in the order for um, a dysphagia evaluation. We go in and we assess initially. First thing I'm looking at is their level of alertness. Then what is their voice like, especially getting in that early Sometimes patients just aren't ready, and we definitely find that. Um, But some patients amaze us. We just had a gentleman with COVID that did beautifully on his A through F bundle, was very minimally sedated, whose voice and his cognition was great right after extubation. He was able to start on a diet. Um, we look at voice, we look at oral motor. So how well are they moving their mouth, tongue, lips? Then I slowly start with, a lot of times I start with oral care. Our nursing staff, the protocol is oral care every two hours. Sometimes we all know in the medical setting though, that could be better. So there are times where my first step is just cleaning out their mouth, getting their mouth cleaned out, and then we'll try some ice chips. And I really go from there based on the patient and how well they tolerate. It's a general clinical swallow eval that you would do on any other floor with the added looking at respiratory rate, looking at oxygen. We have found that patients... With COVID, really, we really have to watch oxygen saturations and respiratory rate with these patients. Um, We look at how well can they feed themselves. Some of these patients have 
ICU acquired weakness and they can't get their hands to their mouth. So they may, may need a softer food diet or their food cut up just because feeding is a challenge. What I do find with these patients is a lot of them get better in that 24 to 48 hour window. So we may just start with ice chips for overnight and come in and they might be doing better and able to advance their diet. Others we're recommending for an instrumental exam. So we're taking them to radiology. It really is so patient specific. And there's a lot of factors that play into diet recommendations. But once they're extubated, the clinical swallow evaluation looks very similar to the general medical floors with the close monitoring of respiratory status. Can you share with us a story of a patient that you will always remember or you're like, this is why I do what I do? Absolutely. Um, She actually just came back up this past week. We are a college town and I feel like it's okay to share this. She, it's, it's been in the news. A young girl had a cardiac arrest in the parking lot. Um, No one really knows why, but she had a cardiac arrest. She was on the ventilator. She also had a small stroke. So when she was intubated, we were working on communication with pointing initially. She was eventually able to do writing. And at one point we even brought in her laptop so she could type. She then was extubated and that 20 something had a pretty horrible swallow. No one likes to see a 20 year old on thick and liquids. Mm -hmm. Um, She actually was NPO initially thinking back on it. She had a feeding tube because of her cardiac arrest. She had a mild anoxic brain injury injury as well. We worked very hard on her swallowing and she was a PA. Was she a PhD student or a master's student? She was a higher advanced degree student, smart girl. So we also worked hard on cognition. This was pre-COVID. So we were able to eventually, in the ICU, we're doing aggressive therapy. We were able to take her out of her room, do some functional tasks with like navigating the hospital and following multiple step directions, complex commands. She eventually left our facility, went to an acute rehab and a year, year later, she's graduated and has done extremely well. She had a 2% survival rate and she is now working and healthy on a regular diet. She was a true success. Excellent. Yes. For sharing that. What are some of the challenges working in the intensive care unit as an SLP? With the year of COVID, it has been extremely emotional. Mm -hmm. It's been hard to see patients in isolation who aren't doing well and are scared and Sometimes we're the only contact they have and the nurses and the other therapist. But when you think a 30 minute visit might be there face to face, even though it's masked and face shield, or we may be their only physical contact for the day. It's been hard. It's been the hardest year of my career for sure. It's been emotional. We have lost patients that... Me too. Yes, that... um, I mean, the attachment that we've gotten to these patients has been nothing that I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And, And it's still going on. It's not over. We have a gentleman right now that that might not make it and before he was intubated was able to just... He was telling us... He was fine. He's sitting on, he had high flow. 
he's cognitively fine. I think that's what's been so hard about these patients is that they're with it. And minus their respiratory status, they're doing fine. And then they need to be intubated and getting some of these patients off the ventilator has been so challenging. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just been hard. Yeah, I would agree with that. My daughter-in-law is an ICU nurse. And the listeners don't know this, but you do. I'm up visiting my kids and um, we were talking last night because we just love, and my son in law, my, my son is a nurse and we just love talking medical stories. And she has been a nurse for two years. And so she was saying, yeah, I really understand now what a speech pathologist does. And she was sharing with me a story of a patient who was cognitively with it and, and talking and, and everything. And she had a sweetheart, just a long, she was in her mid sixties and she'd been married for quite some years and her and her husband were just in love with each other. And they were at the point where they needed to intubate her. And so she helped her with that phone call before they intubated her. And she got to tell her husband how much she loved him. And and they talked about the kids and such as that. And then she was intubated and then she began to not do so well. And it was a speech pathologist who came in and opened up this just gives me goosebumps opened up that communication for her so she could write and she did end up passing yeah but because of that speech pathologist and that whiteboard she was able to say her final words and the family was able to to read them i think mental i think the pandemic will hopefully change some of the tra- trajectory mm-hmm. of our field. I, for two or three years pre pre pandemic, have been advocating for this position and and really getting integrated into the ICU. And my facility accepted us, but man, there's not a lot of resources out there for a critical care speech pathologist. And a lot of it, I was being creative and honestly, at times winging it, not in the realm of swallowing, because I feel like our field is, is there for swallowing, but for communication for these patients, Mm -hmm. there isn't a lot of continuing education and there, there hasn't been a lot of information out there about the long-term cognitive deficits that come with a critical care stay. Right. It has there are research articles that say that there that these exist, but there hasn't been a lot of information for what do we do about it. Right. So working with our physicians and working with our team, we've really developed what we think we are trying to, COVID has made it complicated, but our OT and myself have been trying to collect data to show that what early intervention for communication and cognition does in the ICU. And we've had decent outcomes. There's research that shows that one year after a critical care stay, patients have the equivalent to mild cognitive deficits, which is which is a dementia. And we are finding that a lot of patients immediately after um, extubation score like an uh, an average 17, 18 on the MOCA, which is moderate cognitive deficits. Out of 30, 17, 18 out of 30. Out of 30. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Um, so our hope is that with getting in and doing earlier intervention, helping with communication, that we're preventing some of those deficits. Right. And with the pandemic, there has been, it's been in the media even, how important communication is with these patients and that patients that have brain fog, have memory loss after COVID really aren't any different. It is it is related to COVID, but our ARDS patients are having those or just our respiratory failure or COPD exacerbation patients have had these needs for years and we haven't been addressing them. And I think it's really important that as a field, we start addressing these things and we're helping patients with communication because it's important. Even pre-COVID, it was important. 
What is one of the most rewarding things you find about being a speech pathologist? I, for a huge part of my career, I love swallowing. Again, getting into the ICU though and working on communication has just lit a fire in me. Hearing, putting a passing ear valve on someone and hearing their voice for the first time, it makes me emotional. I, I almost always cry <laughs> because the look on their faces when they hear their own voice, mm-hmm. giving someone a voice is so important for them to be able to tell their wants and needs, even if that is writing. But hearing a patient's actual voice is just one of my favorite things to do. And then also, I still love swallowing. That part hasn't gone away. Getting a patient who we worked and worked and worked and worked on swallowing down to a regular diet. And my favorite thing is to take them to get a pop afterwards. Almost everyone always wants a Diet Coke or a Pepsi or a Mountain Dew. And we will go to the coffee shop and we will get a pop and celebrate when they get down to that regular diet. That is also still one of my my favorite things is, is progressing someone from being in PO all the way through the realm to getting them back to, to really a regular regular food. So I love both aspects of it. I love communication and I still love swallowing too. Well, that's one of the beauties of our career is, is, and I'm much like you when I'm working with a voice patient or putting a passing mirror valve in, which is one of the stories my daughter-in-law shared again last night was hearing, watching a speech pathologist put a passing mirror valve in and the patient had her voice back after six weeks. Yes. Not the voice. So in that moment, I'm like, oh, this is my favorite. And then I'll do a video swallow. Oh, this is my favorite. Yeah. I, ju- I love I love the engagement that we can have and my small ability to play a positive part in somebody's yes. communication or eating recovery. Yes. I, my husband makes fun of me because I will, any high school, senior, upperclassmen, I will grab them and say, maybe you should be a speech pathologist. <laughs> have you ever considered this field? And Actually, even just this week, our little kindergarten neighbor, as she was telling me, maybe I should write a note on my door to remind my kids to wear a mask to school. I said, you know what? You would make a great speech pathologist and help people with their memory strategies. So I love our field. I love the flexibility of it. I can't get enough of the medical field. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also really appreciate that if someone wanted to say someone wanted to leave the medical field and go to the schools, that's an option available. There's so much you can do with it. I also am a mom and I have only worked part-time since I had my kids and it gives me a great work-life balance. And with the moves that we have done, I've never had a hard time finding a job in a hospital that allows me that part-time flexibility where I can be home with my kids, but also be at work. And when I'm at work, I can give 110% because I've had that work-life balance. Great. Final words of advice. Advocate for yourself. Advocate, Advocate for our profession. We have a place at the table in the ICU. And it takes a lot of work. Get to know your physicians, get to know the other team members in the ICU. And you can find your, you can build a program that's successful in the ICU by working with a team. It, it cannot be done alone, but by working with a team, you can advocate for yourself and have a place in the ICU. Thank you. You're welcome. So you're going to give us some of those resources in that we'll include in the show notes. We'll find them there. Yes. I will. um, I will send you a list of resources that I find are beneficial. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time today, Jessica. Thank you. This was excellent. Thanks.
hope today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP. Continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the Missing Link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You got this.